Today on Earth Focus, scientists and evangelicals join forces to protect the environment. Time Magazine called them two of the 100 most influential people in the world. Harvard professor Eric Chivian and ordained Presbyterian minister Richard Sizek. They may not see the world the same way, but they do share a common passion, the environment. Earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson speaks with both to find out why today on Earth Focus. Dr. Eric Chivian is the founder and director of the Center for Health and the Global Environment at Harvard Medical School. The center was established in 1996 to expand environmental education at medical schools and to promote an awareness of the health consequences of environmental change. Chivian is also an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard University. In 1980, Dr. Chivian co-founded International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War and shared the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985 for bringing together American and Soviet doctors to step across the ideology of the Cold War and together to warn the world about the consequences of nuclear conflict. Today, Chivian is bridging another ideological gap with equally enormous consequences for human survival, the gap between evangelical Christianity and the scientific community on the issue of global climate change. Eric Chivian described his work with the evangelical community and spoke about his new book on biodiversity and human health with Miles Benson. Over 100 leading scientists contributed to Sustaining Life, How Human Health Depends on Biodiversity. The book was launched in May 2008 at a presentation and book signing at the Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. It is the first full examination of the relationship between biodiversity decline and human health. Dr. Eric Chivian. Tell us about your new book. What's the title? What does it say? The title is Sustaining Life, How Human Health Depends on Biodiversity. And it's a, a book about our relationship to nature. And it defines that relationship by how our health and our lives uh, depend on the health of the natural world. The purpose of this book is to translate the technical science of, of threats to the natural world that we feel is too abstract for most, for many people, particularly people in the industrialized world, into the concrete personal terms of human health that all of us can relate to. What you're saying is that uh, you don't have to be a polar bear to worry about environmental degradation. How exactly does it affect our own health? Polar bears have become the sort of iconic organism for global warming. They're the largest land carnivores. They've been on Earth for almost 200,000 years. That's the same amount of time Homo sapiens have been on Earth. And people are very distressed by their being threatened by global warming. It's rarely mentioned that they are very important to human health. They don't actually hibernate. They, they go into a state of decreased metabolic rate during which they don't eat. They don't drink, they don't urinate, they don't defecate, they're largely immobile. And these periods can last for five, even seven, and sometimes even nine months. All mammals, including human beings, when they're immobile, lose bone mass. We develop osteoporosis. Polar bears do not develop osteoporosis. They recycle their calcium. They actually make new bone while they're immobile and not eating. It's a physiologic evolutionary marvel. So people are looking at the substances in polar bears' blood that prevent them from becoming osteoporotic. This is an enormous public health problem. It kills 70,000 people in the United States every year. It costs the U.S. economy $18 billion a year. Bears don't get osteoporosis. If we understood that, we could perhaps prevent or treat osteoporosis. They also don't get uh, toxicity from not urinating. If we don't urinate for a few days, it's toxic to our system. And there's no treatment for end-stage renal disease except dialysis or a kidney transplant. Bears don't become toxic. They reabsorb their urinary waste. They break them down. They make new proteins. Nobody fully understands that. Bears become massively obese prior to the time they are, enter denning. They're eating a largely fat diet. When we become massively obese, our cells develop insulin resistant and we become diabetic. 
Obesity-related diabetes type 2 in the United States now is epidemic. There are over 16 million uh, obesity-related diabetics in the United States now, six, over 6% 6 of the population. We have to study bears in the wild to understand how they avoid getting these huge public health problems. Let me give you one more example. There are two species of uh, frogs that were discovered in the rainforest of Australia. They're called gastric brooding frogs. The female swallows the fertilized eggs and they hatch in her stomach and become tadpoles. And when the tadpoles reach a certain level of development, she vomits them out into the environment and they continue their development to become adults. Well, the tadpoles, it was discovered, made and released certain substances that prevented the acid secretion in the stomach. So they started studying what these substances were. They never were able to characterize them. Both species of frogs went extinct. They may have been the result of millions of years of evolution, and we will never know what they were. You've been at this for a long time. And in fact, 15 years ago, you declared a medical emergency and you wrote that human activity is causing the extinction of animal, plant, and microbial species at rates thousands of times those that would have occurred naturally. Has that activity slowed down since then, or has it speeded up? I'm sorry to say it has not slowed down. We're causing more changes in land use. We're increasing the temperature of the atmosphere. We're dumping more chemicals into the environment that we don't know what they do, and they affect uh, species and ecosystems. Um, so I'm afraid those rates have increased. And you know, a prime example of that is what's happening with coral reefs. Coral reefs live within a very narrow temperature envelope in the tropics, so that if you warm the sea surface temperatures where corals live, as much as just by a few degrees over a few days, they do what's called bleach their immune systems become very uh, impaired because they're no longer getting the nutrients and oxygen they need. And they become subject to various kinds of infections and, and often die. And corals are threatened uh, in many parts of the world uh, at, at high levels. They've discovered organisms that live in corals. They're, they're snails. They're called cone snails. They have very large number of species, maybe 700 different species. They're predatory. They fire a poison-coated dart at their prey, both to defend themselves but also to eat, and paralyze worms, small fish, even other snails, and then bring them into their stomachs and digest them. Each snail, and as I say, there may be as many as 700 species, makes 100 to even 200 distinct toxins, poisons, and the, they coat these harpoons with a cocktail of these poisons. And they've started investigating what these, how these poisons work. The most research has been in pain, painkillers that have been derived from cone snail toxins. And one of those painkillers is now on the market from cone snails. Its, uh, its chemical name is Zaconitide. Its trade name on the market is Prealt. Now what's so important about this particular painkiller is not the fact that it's a thousand times more potent than morphine, which is our main stay of, of pain treatment for patients in chronic pain, but that it doesn't cause addiction or tolerance. This cone snail painkiller doesn't cause tolerance, and yet it's enormously potent. So here is a watershed event in medicine, in some ways equivalent to the discovery of penicillin. Because now we have the possibility of really treating patients in severe chronic pain for the first time. And it all comes from this cone snail toxin. And the cone snails depend on the survival of the reefs. You got it. And we're killing the reefs. You got it. Cone snails may have more potential medicines for human beings than any group of organisms in nature. One of the uh, things you've been doing to try to uh, educate people and uh, to build a coalition uh, to pay more attention to these problems is uh, outreach to the evangelical community. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your relationship with uh, Richard sure. Sizek, the Reverend sure. Richard Sizek, and, and how that uh, is helping? Sure. 
I, if you asked me five years ago, would I count a senior evangelical Christian as among my best friends, uh, I would have smiled, if not laughed. Because at that time, I saw people in the evangelical world as very much opposed to my core beliefs. Uh, and so I approached a, a meeting with uh, Richard uh, some th almost three years ago that was arranged by a mutual friend of ours with some trepidation. I, I saw Richard as, uh, uh, we, we joke about it now, but uh, he saw me, and he admits this, because we both carry these stereotypes into this lunch meeting, he saw me as a, you know, latte sipping, Chardonnay drinking, uh, you know, endive munching, Prius driving, New York Times reading, liberal, you know, as a Harvard faculty member and obviously elitist and a feat. And I saw him as a, you know, uh, I don't know, pork rind eating, uh, uh, SUV driving, Bud Light drinking, uh, you know, whatever. Um, and so there was a certain amount of anxiety with this meeting. And, uh, you know, we thought we'd not have that much to talk about and it would be a tense time. And what we discovered was that we really liked each other. And um, I think that was a huge surprise to both of us. Um, and I think what it was based on is that we learned uh, very quickly that we shared uh, things that were far more important than things that we may have differed about. And what we shared was uh, a really deep and fundamental belief that life on earth was sacred. He saw it as God's creation and that it was a sin to damage it. I saw it as the product of three and a half billion years of evolution, including us. Um, and that it was a sin to destroy it. So um, I think the passion and the sense of responsibility for that was equal, was no different. I started thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful if Richard and I could bring together leading scientists and leading evangelicals for a retreat? And I think what was very quickly clear was that there was no such thing as a Republican environment and a Democrat environment and a, a liberal or conservative environment or a secular or a religious environment. There was just one environment. All of our kids, you know, breathed the same air and drank the same water and ate the same food and we were all worried about them. We realized we were onto something here and uh, we wrote a joint statement together that we released at the National Press Club, which got a lot of attention and was a very strong statement. It was called, uh, Scientists and Evangelicals Unite to Protect Creation. That was interesting, because you'd think the scientists would be unhappy about the word creation. But Ed Wilson had just written a book called The Creation about the biological world, and we realized it didn't matter. We weren't calling it God's creation, we were calling it the creation, and everyone was fine with that. And we really spoke with one voice uh, at this press conference. It was quite something, and committed to keep working together. Thank you very much, Dr. Chivian. Thank you so much. As Vice President for Governmental Affairs of the National Association of Evangelicals, Reverend Richard Sizick is one of the most prominent evangelical lobbyists in the United States. About 100 million Americans and one out of four adult voters in the country consider themselves to be evangelical. Since 2003, Reverend Sizick has been active in a type of environmentalism he calls creation care, which he says has roots not in politics or ideology, but in scripture. For this, he has been widely criticized by fellow evangelicals and conservatives, some calling for his resignation. Today, Reverend Sizick is working with Dr. Eric Chivian on the Scientists and Evangelicals Initiative, a program to bring scientists and evangelicals together to protect the global environment. He tells Miles Benson why. Reverend Sizick, in 2002, you went to Oxford, England to listen to Sir John Houghton, a scientist and an evangelical Christian, and you had a, something of an epiphany. Could you describe that? I would say it was a conversion. Now, some would object to my using the term, but when you turn and go another direction, 
and repent, so to speak. In the Greek, the word is metanoia, which means you turn and go another direction. So that's what I did when I heard the science of climate change in 2002 at Oxford. So I say I did have a, a second conversion, and the first being to Jesus, to live my life the way Jesus would have me to live. And the second was, well, to living his life as he would have me live it here on this earth with respect to nature and even all the issues that arise when nature is threatened, as I believe it is, imperiled by climate change, habitat destruction, species extinction, pollution. All these are threats to God's world. And if so, well, I had a conversion to doing something about these things. What did you hear at Oxford that convinced you mm -hmm. that the, the, the world, that creation was in peril? Well, I saw the statistics, first of all, that by 2020, for example, 1.7 billion people are threatened by water scarcity. Well, scientists such as E.O. Wilson, a Harvard professor, has written that by mid-century, this century, half of all created species are in some danger of extinction. And so when you put all of that together, all the science of the threat together, you can't simply say, well, no matter to me, I have no obligation to care for it. Are you a spiritual advisor to the environmentalist community, or are you a environmental advisor to the evangelical community? There needs to be a rapprochement, if you will, between evangelicals and science generally in order to be able to understand what's happening to the created world we live in and what we're going to have to do in order to save it. To do that, you've made common cause with a number of scientists who are very deeply interested and involved in environmental uh, concerns. One of them is Dr. Eric Chivian, another Harvard professor. Uh, uh, could you explain your relationship with him and what you've been doing? A friend of mine in the environmental movement introduced me to Dr. Shibian at Harvard, who heads the Center for Health and the Global Environment. Well, we developed a friendship, and out of that friendship grew an historic document between scientists and evangelicals that was released last year, uh, a document that says we together must address these issues uh, that face the planet. And so thus began a whole conversation, not just between myself and Eric, but between many leaders in our movement and many scientists. And so this conversation in many ways reverses, I believe it will, as it plays itself out, the hundred years of, well, some would say uh, a war between religion and science that began with the Scopes monkey trial in the early uh, 20th century, 1925. And so what is occurring now is a conversation. Doesn't, doesn't mean that we agree on origins debate. In other words, evangelicals aren't going to accept evolution, and not all scientists by any stretch of the imagination are going to come to an agreement with us about creation or who created this earth, but at least we ought to be able to agree that we ought to save it. Can we? Climate change is already changing this world. Some of it is irreversible. Can we save this planet? We must. If we don't, uh, we will face, I think as a Christian speaking now, someone who believes in God, God's judgment, because he said to care for it and protect it. And so can it be done? I believe so, yes, but only if we do it together. Because science enables us to understand what creation is telling us about itself and its maker. And what science is saying is very clear. Now, there are those who say the science on climate change is disputable and not all uh, the impacts are going to be as bad as some say they are. Well, fine, have the debate. Have that debate about future impacts. But it still doesn't absolve us of the responsibility to act to do what we know we can do.
The problem is not whether we know enough to act. The problem is we don't have the political will to act. Part of the problem has been the Republican Party, in part, my party. And so evangelicals are in a unique position to change the Republican Party because we constitute 40 to 50 percent of it, of that broad conservative coalition. And when evangelicals speak, Republicans generally listen. This begs the order. question. You've been at this project now for several years. Yeah. Uh, how much success have you had and how do you measure it, both in uh, leading the evangelical yes. community to a greater understanding and acceptance of the importance of these issues and also making that influence felt by the political leadership in this country that you want to see responsive to these concerns. If you look at the figures recently released, 84 percent of evangelicals now support a mandatory cap on greenhouse gas emissions. 84 percent. Seventy percent say they would support legislation to curb greenhouse gas emissions, even if it means a monthly household expense of fifteen dollars. Uh, Seventy percent believe global warming is a problem that will impact future generations. And a figure of sixty-four percent say we should take immediate action now. The stakes could not be higher. I would argue, you see, as a Christian, the stakes are not just for this planet. The stakes are spiritual for us, for everyone, but particularly the church. I say it this way. When you die, God will not ask you how he created this earth. He will ask, what did you do with what I created? And all too many of us heretofore would have been quite willing to say nothing, but we can't do that any more because if you believe the science, individuals such as uh, James Hansen, well-known NASA scientist who says we're on a, on a short fuse here, if you believe Dr. Hansen, Dr. Shibian, Dr. Wilson, and most of the scientists in this country and around the world, then we can't lollygag around for another 10 or 20 years thinking it's going to be okay. What is keeping the preachers from preaching in the pulpit on this subject? They're intimidated. By whom? By members of their own congregation who don't want to hear. I have been in chapels, Hardin-Simmons University in Abilene, Texas, where somebody stood up in the middle of chapel, over a thousand students, and said, you don't need to pay any attention to this. Jesus is coming again. And I simply responded, well, let me answer that question. Well, anyway, uh, pastors are intimidated because one person might stand up in a congregation and say, I don't believe this, and walk out, and what if it's a member of the elder board or a major contributor to the congregation? A lot of pastors are afraid. They're intimidated by this, and yet the leaders of the Evangelical Climate Initiative that in 2006 released the initiative saying climate change is real, it's human-induced, it will have consequences, particularly on the poor around the world, and we have to do something about this. Those leaders, over a hundred major organizational leaders, came forward and said this and did it. And they began by saying, quoting the Bible itself, God says, He says, Do what is right and be not afraid. Why did they say that? because they knew what would happen. And let's face it, it's happened to me. People who want to take away my job because I happen to believe that climate change is real. And this is an old story, but over 25 leaders in the religious right wrote a letter to the association saying that I should be silenced or fired because of my views on this subject. But you weren't. No. <laughs> and you don't expect to be. Not that they be. didn't try. And you don't expect to be. And I don't expect to be. Of course not. Uh, the the, the leaders of the association backed me up. So those majorities you talk about within the evangelical community need to raise their voice and be heard. Oh, most assuredly. Absolutely. And they, sh they should do this out of uh, biblical faithfulness more than anything else. Pilate said to Jesus, don't you know that I have the power to crucify you or release you? And Jesus said, 
You have no power except it be given you from above. And what did he mean by that? And what he meant was that, Pilate, you are accountable to a higher authority. You have no power except it be given you from a higher authority is what he said. And he said, you have been given that authority and you will be held accountable to the person who gave it to you. And so to my friends on Capitol Hill, I say, you have authority. It was given you. And so also to this president. You have authority. It was given you. But you will be held accountable to a higher authority. And in this case, on this issue, we're talking now not simply about a piece of environmental legislation such as saving a lake or a river or the Clean Water Act or whatever. We're now talking, I would say, about the planet and whether we have the moral will to do that which is right to protect it. Reverend Sizek, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much. My, my pleasure. God bless you. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only US network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world.